Jared, welcome. Thank you, Walter. And congratulations. Thank you. New York Times bestseller. Not bad, not bad. I, I owe that to you, Walter, yeah. so thank you. And uh, your parents are here, so you should right there. Yeah. always give your parents a shout out. This is my only mentorly advice for you tonight. So how did this come about? Well, I feel like that gives me the perfect chance to give my parents a, a shout out because it's, you know, I work in tech and I worked in foreign policy, so people are always surprised that I wrote a book about uh, eight times a president died in office. Mm -hmm. uh, but my parents, when I was eight years old, they bought me a children's book called The Buck Stops Here. It was one of these rhyming books, one, mm -hmm. uh, one president per page. Um, and my parents wanted to turn me into a precocious child, and like an eight-year-old, I zeroed in on death and assassination. And I still remember the rhymes, right? So my favorite one was 35 is young John F., another president shot to death, Ooh. right? So you remember these things as, as a kid, and I spent my entire life obsessively reading about presidents who died in office and the presidents who accidentally ended up in charge. So when my wife was pregnant with our now five-year-old, I needed a nesting activity because I was annoying everybody, and there was something about having a kid of my own that made me feel feel childish and resurrect this old interest. And I talked to you, Walter, and I said, I don't know if I can do this. Should I write this book? And you said, yes. Yes, yes. Well, so here you we are. always write books because it gets you invited to the 92nd Street. Why? <laughs> That's the reason. And by the way, before we get into the book, your apartment is like a Smithsonian of presidential memorabilia, right? Yeah, there's a lot of people who disagree with this strategy of living, um, yeah, right. including the people I live with. Um, your wife? But, I went, uh, yes. And how many of your children have? <laughs> well, the, the, the children, they like it now. They won't like it later. Uh -huh. um, but it's true that I've been a collector of presidential memorabilia my, my whole life. So I have a painting painted by Eisenhower while he was president. Uh, the most exotic parts of the collection besides the autographs are the locks of presidential hair, which mm -hmm. is weird until you see it, in which case it becomes very cool. Uh, so like George Washington, John Adams, um, Abraham Lincoln from the night of his assassination. You, you've seen it. It's not that Well, I've strange. seen it. It's, yeah. it's totally awesome. And, and then the great bumper stickers yes. and, and, you know, campaign memorabilia. So, so let's get into accidental presidents. It's happened eight times. How did it begin? What was the first time? So I think we have to start with the framers of the Constitution who didn't want a vice president to begin with. They didn't see the need for the, for the office. They ultimately decided to have a vice president as an electoral mechanism for the person who got the second largest number of, of votes. Um, then you have the 12th Amendment in 1804, which says you cast separate ballots for uh, the president and the, and the vice president. But when the first president dies in office, William Henry Harrison, um, he dies after only 30 days it, uh, following taking the oath of office. And he, he doesn't die of pneumonia like everybody thinks. He dies because the sewage system uh, around the White House is, is actually unsanitary. Very septic poisoning. Um, it actually killed several presidents, yeah. not just William Henry Harrison. Um, but John Tyler of Virginia, who's known as the second part of the catchy slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, is thrown on the ticket basically to win Virginia. And Harrison delivers the longest inaugural address in history. And then Tyler basically skips town back to his plantation, expecting never to really be heard from again. Now, when Harrison dies after 30 days, it's important to remember the Constitution does not say that the vice president becomes president. The Constitution is incredibly vague about this. The language indicates that the vice president assumes the duties, but not necessarily the office. And now, that's the phrase, assume, will assume the duties of. Well, the, the, the phrase talks about in the event of resignation, death, or disability of the office of the President of the United States, the same shall devolve on the Vice President. And there's tremendous disagreement about what was meant by the word same and the word devolve. Um, the only person who thinks he's president is John Tyler. So he races back from Virginia in the middle of the night through a combination of horse-drawn carriage, uh, rail, and steamboat, and he prepares to have a showdown with the cabinet who tells him he's an acting president. And he says, I'm not. You can all tender your resignations if you disagree. He then fights with Congress for three months who wants to call him acting president, wants to call him vice president acting as president, lots of different names. And, and he won't answer any letters or any memos that don't call him president, right? All the way until the end of his life, anybody who sent him a letter addressed to the vice president, um, he returned it back unopened. Um, and so he ends, up winning the, he ends up winning this battle with Congress. They get so angry at, it, at him that they end up excommunicating him uh, from the party. So to this day, he's the only president to be formally kicked out of his own party. And so we think the current president is, is sort of impulsive and, 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 and so forth. But John Tyler, recognizing that the only path to winning election in his own right in 1844 was to throw a wrench in the political discourse, decides to engage in all sorts of covert activities to annex Texas, uh, which precipitates war with Mexico. So that was pretty impulsive. <laughs> and uh, so he becomes president in his mind and president in 
and then there's all sorts of things. He almost gets killed in a, 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 an explosion on a boat. That, that's right, and it's important also to remember, John, this precedent that Tyler sets in 1841 is not formalized until you have the 25th Amendment in 1967. So Lyndon Johnson becomes president in 1963 based on a precedent set by John Tyler in 1841. Now, there's also no provision for replacing the vice president until the 25th Amendment in 1967. And six of the eight accidental presidents themselves almost died in office, including John Tyler. And you allude to this ship explosion. So February 28th, 1844, uh, John Tyler and everybody who matters in Washington is sailing on board the USS Princeton down the Potomac. Um, and as they go past George Washington's home at Mount Vernon, um, they decide to fire this long gun called the Peacemaker. It's a sort of state-of-the-art you know, uh, illustration of, of naval capability. Uh, the gun explodes and it kills the Secretary of State, it kills the Secretary of the Navy, it kills multiple uh, foreign ministers, it kills several ambassadors, it kills John Tyler's favorite slave, and it would have killed the nation's first accidental president had he not been below deck flirting with a woman who was half his age and more interested in the captain's son. Right. Um, now, um, they hear the explosion, and both John Tyler and the woman he, he, he fawns after, they end up going up to the deck, and they see everybody dead on the ground, including her father, who's a New York State Senator. She faints into his arms. Um, he picks her up. Um, you know, back then, the Secret Service didn't exist, and they weren't scooping the president out of, out of town. He carries her down the gangplank, and she writes later on that she was startled, not realizing who was carrying her, and nearly knocked them both off the gangplank to their death. Um, so had John Tyler died um, on the USS Princeton, I doubt that precedent would have, would have held. Now, funny fact, we know a lot about this story between John Tyler and this woman half his age yeah. that, 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 that he loved because she wasn't interested in him until um, her father died and then in some sort of weird psychological thing that I can't remember the term for, uh, my dad, who's a psychologist, will, will, will know. Um, she ends up falling in love with him and they get married right here in the, in, in the West Village mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a secret wedding. And we know tons about this love story because John Tyler, who was born during the administration of George Washington, still has two grandsons who are alive. So how is that possible? Because and they kind of look like him too. So he fathered wait, wait, alive today. Alive today. So he fathered two children in his uh, he fathered two children in his 70s, uh, and the last that he fathered fathered two children in his 70s, and those two children are in their late 90s. Hmm, amazing. Amazing, right? And it's an amazing story. This gunboat explosion, which is very dramatic in your book, but I had not uh, read before. Well, it's still to this day the single greatest loss of life of senior U.S. government officials in the history of the Republic. So the only way actually to get a new president is for the Secretary of State to make the ruling to designate one. I mean, we forget that's what Secretary of State was part of the job. And you just told me we lost the Secretary of State in that accident. Uh, that, that's true. So, um, so there would have been nobody with the constitutional authority. So, so the Constitution is not clear that the vice president becomes president, but the Constitution says that if there's a vacancy with the president and the vice president, that at the time the president pro tem becomes an acting president until a special election can be called the following November. But all of that has to be initiated by the Secretary of State, who in this case was dead. Wow. So we did. Uh, it was uh, now. What you have interesting is that Johnson, Andrew Johnson, is the one who helped solidify this precedent. And in your book, Andrew Johnson and Lyndon Johnson are great counterparts or counterpoints. Yeah, I find Andrew Johnson to be truly one of the most disturbing figures to, 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 to go deep on. And, and unfortunately, I sort of had writer's block as I was studying Andrew Johnson. I ended up lingering around him too long and getting in his head. And, but if you look at presidential succession, we, we basically winged it. And it would be easy to say we didn't really have a plan. The Constitution was vague. This was a long sustained constitutional vulnerability. But we more or less got through it OK. But I can't really say that because we were supposed to get Abraham Lincoln's vision for Reconstruction. Instead, the bullet of John Wilkes, Bo uh, Wilkes Booth's gun gave us Andrew Johnson. Now, Andrew Johnson was a man who was born a racist, died a racist, the last president to own slaves. He didn't emancipate his own slaves in Tennessee until seven months after the Emancipation Proclamation. And he resurrects almost every old vestige of the Confederacy, delegates civil rights to the states, um, gives amnesty to all the traitors from the Union, including, the, uh, including Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens, the 
the Confederate vice president. Um, and as a result, you get the Black Codes, which are the precursor to the Jim Crow laws, which gives us 100 years of segregation. He also has the worst debut of any vice president in history. So uh, Andrew Johnson doesn't want to go to the inauguration for two reasons. One, uh, in 1864, and he's thrown on the ticket because Lincoln needs a war Democrat from a border state in order to win. But he's sick with typhoid, and he wants to preside over Tennessee's transition from a civilian government, uh, from a military government to a civilian government. And Lincoln tells him, you have to come to Washington for the inauguration because the world is watching and they, see, they need to see us united and the war is still going on. Um, so Andrew Johnson, to try to sort of deal with his illness, um, and he gets provoked by Hannibal Hamlin, the outgoing VP who's a teetotaler, and he's three glasses of brandy deep, and he delivers what's supposed to be a 30-second inaugural address, and instead he's completely hammered, um, and he stands up there for 17 minutes and drunkenly insults every single member of the oh, cabinet, yeah. including the Secretary of Navy, whose name he can't remember. Um, and then finally, he gasps for breath, um, he's handed the Bible, he stumbles, he slobbers all over it, and then he's too drunk to swear on the new senators, so he asks a Senate clerk, who's basically the equivalent of an intern, and he says, you know, I can't do this, you would do it better than me, you swear them in. But there's something much more substantive that interested me, which is, Andrew Johnson was a unionist. He supported the union very strongly during the war. And yet the minute he becomes president, he flips and starts being a Confederate sympathizer. And the opposite is true of Lyndon Johnson, right. who we don't think of, you know, before he becomes president as somebody who's gonna preside over the greatest civil rights legislation in you know the 20th century. So why those changes? So in the case of Andrew Johnson, um, I wanted to vindicate, when I set out to write this chapter on the Lincoln to Johnson transition, I wanted to vindicate or, or sort of address the one stain on Abraham Lincoln's record, which is putting Andrew Johnson a heartbeat away from the, the, the presidency. And real quick, let me interrupt you. Does he actually put Johnson on the ticket? Is that the way it was done so, then? So back then, the presidential nominee didn't choose the running mate, the party did, but this was such an important election that Lincoln thought he was gonna lose that he engaged in a secret intrigue to get Hannibal Hamlin thrown off the ticket and replaced with Andrew Johnson. So in a rare instance, departing from the norm, he did in fact um, in, engage in efforts to, 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 to engineer this. And um, it becomes his worst decision. And, and of course, he doesn't live long enough to, to realize that. Um, but Andrew Johnson, as much as he was a racist and harbored these horrible views, um, he was one of the poorest men to, to rise to the presidency, and he felt like he owed everything to the Union. So when the Confederate States seceded, Andrew Johnson just tactically wanted to put the Union back together, and his view is the best way to put the Union back together is to break the Confederacy. And the best way, to, best way to break the Confederacy is to go after its economic livelihood. So his rhetoric on civil rights for tactical reasons in 1864 is even more forward-leaning than Abraham Lincoln. And there's this great moment where he emancipates the slaves in Tennessee, and he's standing on the steps of the Capitol, and someone shouts out that you're the black Moses. And he says, yes, I am your Moses. And he literally reenacts you know, the, the, the sort of Moses moment for all of these emancipated slaves. And he doesn't actually change his views when he becomes president. And this is why when he becomes president, the radical Republicans are, in, are, are ecstatic because they think one of their own um, is, is gonna now be, 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 be in the White House. And they felt Lincoln didn't go far enough. But when the Civil War ends shortly after in, into, into Johnson's presidency, the radical Republicans realize that he's not one of them. Um, the Union, you know, the, the Confederacy has been broken. And at that point, he just wants to get the new, um, newly elected officials in, in the South seated back in, 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 in Congress, which is why he says, let the states deal with civil rights. Let's just give everybody- But he's also a racist. He's always been a racist, but, but with the union back together, um, there's nothing to overshadow his racist views. One of the interesting things about Tyler and then about Andrew Johnson is when they become president accidentally, they both almost get kicked out of office. Certainly Tyler gets kicked out. Let's start with Tyler. You got Henry Clay and others you know, trying to just get rid of Tyler, the accidental president. So when, so John Tyler and Henry Clay were, 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 were good friends, and Henry Clay was one of these, you know, figures in the, in the legislature who overshadowed the president. He was a larger-than-life figure of the times and the sort of the father of the Whig Party. And um, by the way, at that time, in some ways, the president 
wasn't necessarily what we think of today as the grandest, most important person in government. A person like Clay could say, I'm actually more important as the person who led the Senate. He, he certainly believed it. And, and you know, you know, back then, you know, William Henry Harrison, for instance, said, you know, one man, one vote in the cabinet, including me, I'm going to let the legislature, you know, drive the agenda. I'm sort of more of a symbolic figurehead. And when which Henry, is what Clay wanted. Which is what Clay wanted. He, he wanted a Manchurian Whig candidate. Um, and when he realizes that John Tyler is going to be a man of his own and depart from the Whig agenda, particularly around the National Bank, which he vetoes twice, um, Clay begins impeachment proceedings against the president for the first time in history. Yeah. So while John Tyler isn't ultimately impeached, although he's kicked out of his own party, the first instance of conversations and proceedings around impeachment happen in the early 1840s over the National Bank and, and John Tyler. Which is interesting because impeachment being used for the very first time is actually a political thing. It's not for truly for crimes and mis high crimes and misdemeanors. It's just politically they wanted them out. Yeah, I, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know why we always act as if impeachment being used as a political tool is a new phenomenon. I impeachment has always been used as a political tool. Even in the case of Andrew Johnson, we trivialize how horrible Andrew Johnson was by focusing on his failure being associated with his impeachment. Andrew Johnson was impeached for violating the Tenure of Office Act, which was later deemed unconstitutional. It's ironic that the thing that we remember most and associate with his failure is actually something that wasn't really that bad. The only time that impeachment proceedings, and obviously Nixon wasn't impeached, but the only time the proceedings are ever driven less by politics and more by high crimes and misdemeanors was in the case of Richard Nixon in the lead up to his resignation. And so that was the only nonpartisan impeachment proceeding we had. Yes. And so Tyler gets kicked out of his party and comes up with either a really bad idea or a very clever idea, which is let me annex Texas and almost start a war, or start a war with Mexico, I think, in order to make sure I get reelected. That's right, and the war, the war gives rise to Zachary Taylor, who is the most famous general coming out of the war, and then, you know, so the Whigs get another general in the White House, and then he dies a year into office, um, and then Millard Fillmore, who I'm sure you've all spent lots of time thinking about, um, takes the oath of office, and the first thing that he does is he sacks the entire cabinet the only time in history um, that a cabinet has been sacked that quickly. Um, and then Congress goes into recess for nine months and there's nobody to lead cabinets um, you know, for a significant period of time. At, by the way, the most polarized moment in American history. I believe that 1850 was the most polarized that we've ever been in the history of the Republic because it was a make it or break it in terms of the Civil War being inevitable. It was so polarized that a senator literally pulled a gun on another senator in the chamber and tried to murder him. Um, it then resulted in a brawl that lasted an hour and 10 minutes, literally with choking and punching and screaming. And by the, the rhetoric that they used to insult each other back then was so amazing, which is, he charged me with inconsistency. Yeah. Right? There, there was sort of an elegance. That's not quite a good tweet. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it was not, not tweet-worthy. But yeah. what's amazing is after, this, after you know, a senator from you know, Mississippi tries to pull a gun on another senator, and after the brawl, you know, everybody's sort of sweaty and shirts unbuttoned, and they sit down and they just kind of get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> and this is all because uh, Clay, you had had the Clay Compromise, but it's basically the Civil War and slavery is the underlying cause. You, you would, At least it was a big issue. And, you, and, and this is amazing, the greatest impediment to the Compromise of 1850, which was you know, a compromise around the admission of California as a free state, the admission of New Mexico as a free state, the abolition of the, sla the slave trade in Washington, D.C., uh, a revised fugitive slave law, and dealing with the Texas-New uh, Mexico boundary. Um, you know, as soon as Zachary Taylor died, it unblocked the Compromise of 1850 and delayed the Civil War by 10 years. Hmm. Is that a good thing? It's a hard question. It depends on whether or not you think the Civil War was inevitable or not. I think that the moment the United States went to war in Mexico, the Civil War became inevitable because that was a war that the United States was going to win. It started in 1846. The, the, the United States was going to win that war, and then if they, went, if they won that war, they were going to acquire a bunch of territory that was not conducive to slavery, and it was going to upset the balance from the Missouri Compromise. Um, and so the moment they went to that, the, the moment they went to war, they were going to have to deal with that reality. One of the things your book shows, as the Reverend Dr. John Meacham says of your <laughs> book, uh, 
is uh, how contingent history is. That, oh, you know, it just, something happens and things change, a, a fork in the road. Was there something contingent that could have happened that could have prevented the Civil War? I mean, I think had John, I mean, again, I think that had William Henry Harrison not died in office, um, you wouldn't have had John Tyler kicked out of his party looking for a path to election in his own right in 1844, looking to prove a point. And, and Harrison was sort of willing to let slavery disappear, was, was that right? Harrison was willing to delegate the future of the country to Henry Clay and the Whig Party, um, who were willing to let slavery disappear. And Tyler is basically a slave owner from Virginia. Correct. Right. So that was the contingent thing. Had the septic tanks at the White House worked and Harrison survived, <laughs> we, it may have been different. And what contingency, let's talk about the contingencies of history, had Andrew Johnson not been the way he was and whatever, could we have avoided the backsliding that makes it 100 years until another Johnson comes along that we don't have civil rights in this country? So I actually think there's a different contingency that happened that, that comes after Andrew Johnson. So whenever I talk about um, the story of civil rights in post-Civil War America, I always say it's a story of two presidential assassinations. So Lincoln's assassination gave us Andrew Johnson, which I already sort of explained as setting us on the path to segregation. But at the convention in 1880, it's supposed to be a competition on the Republican side between Ulysses S. Grant for a non-consecutive third term and James Blaine. Um, and at stake is the Republican nomination, which would be the presidency, which would give the gift of patronage. And everybody's just tired of machine politics. So on the 34th ballot, someone shouts out the name Garfield, James Garfield, um, who was there as the campaign manager of the person running fourth in the delegate count. Um, and next thing he knows, he ends up with the nomination. And he jumps up on stage and he says, I protest, a man who does not seek the nomination should not be able to get the nomination. And he gives it to, they, they give it to him anyway. And James Garfield, to this day, I believe, is the most remarkable human being ever to be nominated and then elected president. Um, he was the poorest man ever to rise to the presidency, born in a log cabin, used to hide runaway slaves in Mentor, Ohio as a kid. Um, you know, he, once he got the nomination against his will, he decided he was gonna take up his two passionate causes. The first was the abolition of the spoils system and the creation of a modern day civil service, but the second was universal education and universal suffrage. And then four months after taking the oath of office, a mentally ill office seeker puts two bullets in his back at the Baltimore and Potomac rail station and he dies 80 days later. And you get Chester Arthur, who's this kind of loathsome character who just isn't really up to the job enough to take the mantle from Garfield. But he could have done it because he was detached from machine politics and he had the- Garfield could Garfield have Garfield was. And he, and he was his own man. And you know, we, you know, the black codes happen beginning with Andrew Johnson, but you don't have the Jim Crow laws until the election of 1876 ends reconstruction. Um, so four years of Jim Crow, you have to imagine the possibility that James Garfield could have walked some of it back. And I love Garfield so much that when um, my wife was pregnant with our second daughter, who's now three, and I got stuck on the Garfield to Arthur chapter, I remember I was sitting at our dining room table and she said, we need a middle name. I could give birth any oh, day. No. And I said, why not Garfield? Uh, so my second daughter's name is Annabelle Garfield Cohen. <laughs> this will cost you in psychiatry bills about eight <laughs> years from now. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> exactly. Ooh. Um, the, we, we've uh, been talking about accidental presidents who aren't the coolest uh, people in the world. Let's talk about the coolest accidental president in my mind. Actually, there are two of them, but let's start with Teddy Roosevelt. So I love Theodore Roosevelt. I have a life-size wax I guess sculpture. I shouldn't be calling him Teddy. You corrected me? Well, he goes by, he, he went by TR, Teddy, and okay. Theodore. Um, I just think Theodore sounds elegant. Yeah, well, um, on the Upper East Side, they yeah, call him yeah, exactly. Teddy. Yeah. Um, but I have a life-size wax sculpture of, of, of Teddy Roosevelt in, in my office. And out of all, out of the eight accidental presidents, the only one who likely would have eventually become president anyway is Theodore Roosevelt. And when the vice president, when Vice President Hobart dies uh, before the 1900 election, uh, McKinley needs a running mate. Um, and the New York party bosses are so tired of Theodore Roosevelt that they want to basically politically murder him. So they pressure McKinley into putting him on the ticket. Um, and it's the, to this day, he's the only person to be nominated as vice president as a punishment. 
um, and, and as a sort of path to, to, to political death. And the term heartbeat away from the president um, is invented by Mark Hanna, who's one of McKinley's close advisors. When, when they win the election of 1900, he says to McKinley, my God, Mr. President, your only responsibility is to live for the next four years so that madman doesn't become president. Of course, why did they think he was a, why did Mark Hanna think he was a madman? Theodore Roosevelt was kind oh, okay, of a madman. Oh, okay, because he was a madman. Um, and, and, and McKinley's assassinated by an anarchist um, you know, less than a year after being, uh, winning the 1900 uh, election. Um, and Theodore Roosevelt, to this day, has the most amazing reaction to it of any of the accidental presidents, uh, because he, he could hardly contain his enthusiasm for the fact that he was about to become president. So he says, and I quote, it's a terrible thing to come into the presidency this way, but it would be far worse to be morbid about it. Yes, right. <laughs> And once again, he comes in and truly grows in office, becomes a trust buster, let's start there. I mean, which is not something that the bosses and others would have wanted. That's right, and he, I call him the great evaporator because you know, within months of his presidency, nobody even remembers William McKinley's name. Um, and I don't, I don't believe that in 1901, the country was ready to elect a man as progressive as Theodore Roosevelt without him first being elevated to the presidency. Um, and he becomes the first accidental president to be elected in his own right uh, in 1904. Um, and by the way, he himself almost dies in office as well. A year after ascending to the presidency, um, he's in Pittsfield and a trolley slams into his carriage. Wait, wait, doesn't Tyler get elected on his own? Uh, no, Tyler, so, so the first to be elected in his own right oh. is, is Theodore Roosevelt, okay. and then every successive accidental president after that. Um, so a trolley slams into his carriage, and he flies 30 mm. feet, lands face down, breaks his glasses, um, the driver is killed, um, his bodyguard is killed, who's, still, who's the first Secret Service agent ever killed in the line of duty. Um, and he ends up in a wheelchair uh, for, for seven weeks. He's still, to this day, the first President Roosevelt uh, to be in a wheelchair while in office. <laughs> but so what made him so great? What did he do that was different than McKinley would have done? I mean, he, he broke up the trusts. Um, he ushered in an era of social progressivism that wasn't on McKinley's agenda. Um, and you know, he, you know, he, he's so progressive that he ends up, you know, sort of turning on his own anointed successor, William Howard Taft, for not being progressive enough and ends up running as a bull moose in 1912, splitting the vote, which gives the presidency to a man even more progressive, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. And of course, when he runs in 1912, he's nearly assassinated. Uh, an assassin shoots him, and uh, the fact that Theodore Roosevelt was so verbose saves his life. The bullet penetrates a 40-page speech, hits his glasses case, um, penetrates his skin, he unbuttons his shirt, and he looks at the crowd and declares that he's an expert taxidermist, and by his calculation, he can survive for 45 minutes before the wound becomes lethal. So he then delivers the speech and goes to the hospital. Whoa. <laughs> uh, the notion of trust busting and breaking things up that way, um, th that had come along, I mean, Brandeis, I think, is sort of thinking about the curse of bigness. Was that something, though, that Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, made into both a Republican and progressive thing? Well, this is what I always find interesting about Theodore Roosevelt. I, you know, he, he looks much more like today's progressive Democrats than he does, you know, um, than, than, than he does a conservative Republican. It's just it's a reminder that you know these parties switch positions and go back and forth throughout our history. I mean, you say, I mean, I still think that the, the fact that. Um, you know, the, the, the Republicans, you know, kind of lost the, 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 the racial equality platform to the Democrats, which had really been the party, it had a huge portion of its party as the, the party, party of segregation, of Lincoln, yeah. um, you know, is one of the great, is one of the great follies. Um, but Republicans up until recently have been in favor of free market competition and thus, to some extent, uh, favoring antitrust, just like Teddy, Theodore Roosevelt did. Yeah, and I think and I think Theodore Roosevelt, you know, initiates a massive transformation in the Republican Party. I mean, if you look at you know McKinley is about big business, and McKinley, you know, is 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 you know is is seen as a kind of corporate guy, and Teddy Roosevelt, you know, is a man who, when he was you know police commissioner in New York, used to run around with a notebook taking notes on you know every little thing. That happened, right? So, 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 so he he turns the Republican Party into a party that's all about you know um, you know social justice on the streets, about rights for workers, um, and then it, it 
transitions from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party when Woodrow Wilson becomes, becomes president. And he helps define the modern presidency in a way, because up until then, presidents weren't that bully pulpitish. He, he defines the modern presidency, but it, you know, it doesn't mean that every president who came after him you know, ends up being a, a modern president. You end up with some real duds in between. <laughs> um, <clears throat> off topic, and you may not want to go here, uh, speaking of you know, antitrust, I know you can't speak about your parent company, Alphabet, and things you've worked for, but this new move to look at breaking up big technology, what do you see as the plus minus there, and what would Teddy Roosevelt think? That's a good. It's a good question. I mean, I think you know. Look, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, took a broad view of of, of trust busting, and for him, it was as much about um, you know, it was as much about a progressive agenda as it was about politics. I mean, Teddy Roosevelt understood the political platform that that one could one could have by virtue of. You but know, he also was in favor. I mean, nowadays in antitrust, we just look at consumer harm. But he was somebody who felt it wasn't just about consumer harm, it was about wanting small businesses to be able to compete and wanting to incent a competitive economy. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, well, it, it's interesting you mentioned Theodore Roosevelt in the context of big tech, um, because I, I actually found myself in writing this book thinking a lot about how Theodore Roosevelt would have adapted to modern technology. Mm -hmm. I actually still to this day think he's the only president um, throughout history that would have given the current one a run for his money on Twitter. Um, he yeah. literally has some of the great catchphrases and slogans Speak throughout history. Speak softly and, and yeah. I mean, he, he, he was as colorful a president yeah. a, 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 as you can imagine. And if you put Theodore Roosevelt in the context of 2019, we would not have been comfortable with him as president. I mean, he was a proper lunatic. I mean, this is a, you, 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 know, you read his Medal of Honor recommendations uh, or nominations when he you know, stormed San Juan Hill as a rough rider, and they describe you know, behavior that resulted in a heroic outcome, but they describe him as a total madman who's gone into some, court, some kind of you know, you know, bloodthirsty trance where he just charges in a suicidal mission you know, into, enemy, into enemy fire. So uh, the next big transition is one that vaguely has echoes of our day and gen of our current situation, which is the Harding mm -hmm. one. I mean, do you, how do you see the, uh, I don't want to get too political here, but the corruption of the Harding period, the explosion of it, and then uh, the Mike Pence that succeeds Harding. Well, Harding, Harding is Harding's a better topic for me than antitrust. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I can tell uh, I got your nervous. I didn't mean to go there. But uh, it was but, like, but I Harding, so much love Teddy Roosevelt. I would say going into this project, the president that I was most excited to write about was Warren Harding, because I always loved presidential scandal. And, mm. and if you read the book, I focus on the scandals and mm. the drama. Um, and the Harding administration was the most scandalous administration in the history of the republic. I think, you know, even if you think yeah, this administration is scandalous. The Harding administration gives it a real run for his money. Um, you had a massive scandal and fraud at the Veterans Bureau orchestrated by the, the, the secretary. Um, you had the Teapot Dome scandal, which was a massive oil scandal. Mm -hmm. You had an attorney general who was complicit and running everything from bootlegging operations, fight fixing, stock manipulation, counterfeiting, you know, you know uh, there's rumors of prostitution rings, um, all out of the Justice Department. Um, and Harding dies before he finishes his presidency. Um, but he dies an incredibly popular man because uh, the scandals haven't broken yet. And he, his presidency is inherited by Calvin Coolidge, who's literally one of the most boring people in the history of the Republic. Intentionally? Uh, so, so he put Calvin Coolidge on the ticket because Calvin Coolidge, as the governor of Massachusetts, had negotiated a police strike and stood firm against striking um, police officers in, in, Mass in Boston and was sort of famous for 15 minutes and Harding wanted to capitalize on that. Um, so, and he was from the Midwest and he needed, uh, he needed New England appeal. So Coolidge is dealing with this problem where he's still the only accidental president to inherit the presidency with less than a year to go before a presidential election, the 1924 election. So he knows that when these scandals break, and it could literally be any month, um, it's going to torpedo his chances of the election. So he does something very savvy. He has a self-reflective moment where he realizes, I'm kind of boring and nobody knows who I am. And there's this great story when he's vice president at the Willard Hotel, uh, and he's at the Willard Hotel, and the hotel's on fire, and they have to evacuate it. 
and, um, and a man comes up to him and says, you know, sir, you need, to, you need to leave the hotel. And he says, but I'm the vice president. And he says, okay, you can stay. And then the man turns around and says, wait, the vice president of what? And he says, the United States. And he says, oh, sir, you need to leave. I thought you were the vice president <laughs> of the hotel. Oh, yeah. um, so what Coolidge does is he, he cultivates this image of silent Cal, uh, a man so boring and so insignificant that he couldn't possibly have been complicit in any of the scandals. And it's a good thing that he did because the scandals break two months after he becomes president and nobody even you know, comes close to thinking he has anything to do with them. So Walter likes this anecdote, and I'll let him be political by, by proxy. Walter likes this anecdote because he thinks that it might resemble something. Mike Pence. Your, your comment, not mine. <laughs> okay. um, speaking of great lines, Teddy Roosevelt's daughter on Calvin Coolidge. Oh. Yeah, so, 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 so oh, she, it was on Warren Harding. So, so I'm sorry. Theodore Roosevelt's um, eldest daughter, um, Alice Longworth, um, who I think somebody should make a TV series on one day. She's Alice a, Roosevelt. She, she, she's, a, she's a fascinating and colorful character. Um, she has a great comment about Warren Harding where she says, Warren Harding's not a bad man. The problem is he's, he's just a slob. Um, and that kind of sums up his presidency. Although his, her other one was when Calvin Coolidge died. Oh yeah, she described him, well she described Calvin Coolidge as a, a pickle or a pickled, a cold pickle or something Well, my, my, the one I was thinking of, when they inform her that Coolidge has died, she says, how can they tell? Well, she said, she did, she, she did, she did say that as well. <laughs> yeah. so we should do a book yeah. on Alice Roosevelt <laughs> Longworth and her husband, Nicholas. So uh, the other extraordinarily interesting one who does a great job is Truman, even though he doesn't prepare himself. He should have. I mean, Roosevelt clearly has some health issues, and Truman is like. So Truman is the most successful out of all the accidental presidents, in part because his success was so unexpected. And we, for, uh, it, because Truman ended up being a successful president, we don't reflect back on what a terrible and reckless choice he was. So in 1944, the Democratic Party bosses, they all know that FDR is a dying man, and they can't fathom the idea of Henry Wallace becoming president because they think he's too liberal and they see him as a Soviet sympathizer. So they recognize that they can't put somebody on the ticket who Roosevelt can't win with. Um, and you know, Harry Truman is kind of the best of the anti-Wallace options. And so against FDR's will, they sort of shove you know, Truman down his throat and Truman ends up getting uh, the nomination as, as vice president. Um, in Truman's 82 days as vice president, he only meets FDR twice, both times superficially. He doesn't get a single intelligence briefing. He doesn't meet a single world leader. Um, he's not briefed on the atomic bomb. He's basically just out socializing about town. So on April 12th, 1945, FDR dies. And by the way, nobody can find Truman. Um, so he's this, drinking this, on Capitol this, this Hill. Is the other thing, for most of these transitions, it took them many hours to find the vice president to inform them that the president was dead, including, including Truman. So Truman arrives at the White House, um, and Eleanor Roosevelt puts her hand on his shoulder and says, Harry, the president is dead. And he says, Eleanor, I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do for you? And she says, oh no, is there anything I can do for you for you're the one in trouble now? Um, now Truman, there's no president in history that inherits a greater collection of problems and crises with less preparation than Harry Truman. So, Here's the sort of range of issues that Truman has sort of fall on his lap. So, you know, the Battle of Okinawa is raging the moment he takes the oath of office, which is one of the fiercest military battles in history. He gets briefed on the atomic bomb for the first time um, and has to figure out what to do about this destructive weapon, which may or may not work. Stalin is reneging on every one of his promises from Yalta. He has to deal with the prospects of maybe moving a million men from the European theater to the Asian Pacific theater. He has to deal with a bureaucratic battle between the army and the navy that threatens the entire war effort. Churchill is a little bit nutso. Um, and he doesn't really know what's going on in the war. So he spends his first three days in the map room where the war is being planned, literally figuring out where these countries are and what the heck has been going on. And yet in his first four months, he makes some of the most important decisions that end the war and shape the post-war order. And so he ends up having an incredible presidency, but it's entirely unexpected. And in the book, I sort of, I, I wrestle with, do I blame FDR for being so reckless? Or do I blame Truman with not doing more to prepare himself? 
And you know, you know, Henry Kissinger had sort of a funny quote in an interview for, for the book where you know, I asked him you know, why you know, FDR, you know, was it that FDR was in denial or why didn't he prepare Truman more? And he said, it's in, in, you know, back then, you know, if you were FDR, the idea of having somebody lingering around you who would be most sort of the greatest beneficiary of you dropping dead wasn't like an appetizing thing that you wanted to happen. And, and you know, in another, I interviewed George H.W. Bush a couple times for the book before he died. And when I asked him about Truman, he said, I didn't think much of Truman. You know, my parents didn't vote for him. I didn't know much about him. But upon reflection, thinking about the success that Harry Truman had, he really felt like, you know, as somebody who was deployed in combat at the time, Harry Truman saved his life. What made Truman, what was in it that Truman had that made him rise to the occasion and as a leader? So here's where I actually think the interesting comparison is Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson more than Lyndon Johnson and Andrew Johnson. And, and, and here's why. Um, a successful accidental president, you know, part of their success is their own decisiveness and willingness to assert themselves, but also rely on the advice of the people who surrounded their predecessor. But the people that they inherit need to want them to be successful. And in the case of Harry Truman, he had men like Dean Acheson and George Marshall who made a decision that they, they knew Harry Truman was an FDR, um, but they also felt like and appreciated given the moment that the fate of the world and the success of the world was entirely dependent on whether or not Harry Truman was successful. Um, so they decided to go all in and help him be successful. But Truman also had the virtue and the sensibility to listen to them. So when they said, let other people worry about Asia, you focus on Europe, he listened to them and he focused, he focused on Europe. You contrast that with Lyndon Johnson, who inherited all the, he inherited all these Kennedy men um, who didn't respect him, he didn't respect them. Um, Johnson knew nothing about foreign policy. Um, he was determined to be a great domestic president, um, and he didn't demonstrate the courage on foreign policy that he, demonstrated on for, that he demonstrated on domestic policy, and he should have gotten rid of Kennedy's foreign policy team. And I believe, and I, I write about this in the book, that the guardians of Kennedy's reputation um, while Johnson is not to be absolved of responsibility for Vietnam, the guardians of Kennedy's reputation have effectively absolved Kennedy of responsibility for Vietnam. Had Kennedy not been shot, would ground troops have been sent to Vietnam? I believe that Kennedy, so if you look at Kennedy, it's Kennedy who, sets us, who starts us down the slippery slope in, into Vietnam in a really meaningful way. He doubles the number of advisors. People often point to, a tr uh, to, to the, the fact that troops came home um, as a deliberate decision to downsize. It was just part of a regular troop rotation. He more than doubles the foreign assistance uh, being pumped into Vietnam. He you know, allows for the coup of the South uh, Vietnamese president to happen, and we didn't see the full effects of that play out uh, for, for, for several years. And while he might not have been predisposed to escalate to 500,000 troops, he was as afraid of the big red arrow as Lyndon Johnson. He was as e maybe even more of a cold warrior than Lyndon Johnson. I think he very easily could have stumbled down that path. I do think had Kennedy not been assassinated, you would not have had the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, the other interesting thing about Kennedy is as president-elect, he's nearly killed by a suicide bomber. Right? We think about suicide yeah. bombers in the context, uh, context of terrorism today, but there was a disgruntled postal worker named Richard Pavlik um, who was really angry at Joe Kennedy for, he believed, buying the presidency for his son. And so he sold his house and all of his property um, and then bought a bunch of dynamite and a Buick and drove down, basically stalked Kennedy all over the country and followed him down to uh, West Palm Beach and uh, stuffed his pants with enough dynamite wow. to blow up an entire church, follows Kennedy to church, um, is standing four feet from him outside with his hand in his pocket on the trigger and his pants stuffed with dynamite and only resists pulling the trigger because he sees some children um, standing next to Kennedy and decides he'll do it the next day. And then of course he's pulled over by the West Palm Beach police. Hmm. Um, on, well, while we await Robert Caro, our hero's next volume on LBJ, Caro, in his earlier volumes, has Lyndon Johnson not so great and even not so resolute on civil rights. Why, you just said, Lyndon Johnson passes what Kennedy couldn't have passed, the most sweeping civil rights legislation of the 20th century. Why? What's in it for a Southern Texan to do that? So there, there's two parts of this. There was why did Lyndon Johnson want to do it, and then why could Johnson do it and Kennedy couldn't? I think the exact description of Lyndon Johnson is kind of a racist Southern Democrat from Texas who took meetings on the toilet is kind of 
what was needed to bring along the southern flank of the Democratic Party. Um, the reason I don't think that Kennedy would have done it is Robert Kennedy was a huge piece of, if you look at Robert Kennedy, um, prior to the 1964 election, before Kennedy's assassination, the Kennedys were prepared to pay lip service to civil rights, but they weren't prepared to do more than that. Um, so I talked to a lot of civil rights leaders um, at the time, and this was the conclusion that they came to. They wouldn't take the electoral risk before 1964. Um, and so I don't believe they would have done it. Whereas Lyndon Johnson, you know, this is the thing with accidental presidents, they kind of have nothing to lose, right? And they, a lot of them kind of swing for the fences and try to go for something big because they're the person the voters didn't want. Right? And so the prospects of winning election in their own right are far more grim than if they were the elected incumbent. And so they try to do something that is a sort of hallmark policy um, that, that, that obfuscates the predecessor who was the person the voters had put, had put in office. And I think with Lyndon Johnson, his, two, his biggest fear was that things were going to fall apart on his watch. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, you know, the, the, the other, you know, we, we talk about the current president watching TV all the time. Lyndon Johnson sat in the Oval Office watching TV constantly. Uh, constantly yelling at the TV, watching TV, and he saw what was happening um, with civil rights in the country, and he said, my God, this is, go this is gonna happen while I'm president. You know, it was less about you know, you know, having a change of heart and more about, I don't want this to blow up on my watch. Um, and I think that that's ultimately what motivated him to do it at that time. With Vietnam, um, you know, I used to fall asleep, when I was writing the book, I would fall asleep to the, to the Lyndon Johnson tapes. Uh, it would give me very strange dreams. Um, and these tapes are incredibly frustrating right. because Johnson knows he's making a terrible decision. He knows what a mistake this is. And he, he's, he's saying it to himself, he's saying it to other people, but he just didn't want to be the person to lose Vietnam. And he's sort of torn between admiration from these elite foreign policy intellectuals that he inherited from Kennedy, who he calls the Harvards, and sort of hating and resenting them. And he wrestles with this psychologically and ultimately lets them win. And this is basically McNamara, Rostell, Bundy's, and all that. And is it just because he's not secure enough in understanding foreign policy? He really didn't understand. I mean, all you have to do is look at him as vice president. He did. He engaged in very bizarre behavior as, as vice president. Mm -hmm. So he, when, he, when he took a trip to, to Vietnam as, as the vice president, you know, he's handing out you know, free tickets to, the, to, to, to attend sessions mm -hmm. in the Senate to like street children in Vietnam. Um, you know, he's you know, running around with cattle and like being photographed mm -hmm. looking ridiculous. When he's in Pakistan, he invites a, cam uh, he invites a camel driver um, to the White House. Um, and the camel driver shows, when he becomes president, the camel driver actually shows up. Um, so he, he, he's just, he's a foreign policy novice. Um, and so, you know, he, with civil rights, you know, he understood how the legislature, I mean, this guy was a, you know, Robert Carroll write, writes about how he's a master of the Senate. He didn't know what he was doing on foreign policy. And he did feel deeply insecure about the McNamara's of the world. There's, um, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin's, Goodwin's late husband, uh, Richard Goodwin, um, writes about how Lyndon Johnson used to copy Robert McNamara, the way Robert McNamara would behave in restaurants and how he would order in this kind of weird like resentment and admiration and emulation of these elites. And there's a great moment when he's, when he's, um, when he's president where he basically instructs one of his advisors who he brings over from the, the Senate with him um, to build his own elite intellectual kitchen cabinet to rival the Kennedy intellectuals who are, who are also advising him. And he can't quite figure it out and he has a first meeting and only half of them show up and there's no mandate and they don't know what they're doing. But one of the things that Lyndon Johnson says about all these incredibly smart Harvard people there is I think he says it to one of his, maybe it was Moyers or one of his people, I just wish one of them had run for sheriff <laughs> once in their life. <laughs> yeah. And that was why, in my mind, Johnson and Truman turned out to be successful ac accidental presidents is because they knew politics. They had actually run at local levels. Yeah, and they knew how to put the work in. Um, and to, to, to that point, you know, you know you know, Truman was a provincial politician from Missouri, but Johnson had given up the most powerful seat in the Senate to become vice president because he had determined that statistically there was a 20% chance that he would become president. Remember, between 1841 and, and 19, well, this happened after, but between 1841 and 1963, the president died in office every 10 to 20 years. So that we're in the, the longest stretch 
when there hasn't been an accidental president. Oh, it's even more interesting than that. Um, yeah, believe me. Um, so I started writing this book before Trump even entered on the scene, and there was no nexus with today's politics. Today, we're in the longest period of time without a president dying in office. We have the oldest president in the history of the republic, and the two leading contenders on the Democratic side are both in their 70s. And yet we still treat, and, and it's worth reflecting on the fact that we almost nominate, we, we almost made Sarah Palin vice president in 2008. So it's not like we've gotten the hang of this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I don't think that's a, I think that's a bipartisan conclusion. Uh, are these are questions from the audience. I assume, am, am I supposed to get more questions, or I'm not, I'm just supposed to read these, okay. Having done this a hundred times, I still am not as good as Jeff Greenfield is in figuring out how you're supposed to do the questions. Do you see any parallels between the election of President Trump against the popular vote, in other words, not having won the popular vote, as making him an accidental president? And I'll add to that, which is, you know, to what extent do you believe that there should be a popular vote versus uh, electoral college? So I actually get asked this question from time to time, and I, I, I basically say Trump's an unexpected president, but it, it's, it's not fair to call him an accidental president because like it or not, you know, the electoral college determines who the president is. This isn't the only time in history that a president has lost the popular vote um, uh, but won, won the election, and you can take issue with our system, and that's something that, that's certainly worth debating, although I see no, I, I, I think there's no chance that it will change. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, in order to be an accidental president, um, you need to literally be thrust into the presidency when nobody intended for you to be there. Just by virtue of getting more than 270 votes, by definition of how our system works, the, you know, we intended for you to be there. Um, I have mixed feelings about the Electoral College because you get rid of it and, you know, basically the co-select the president. Right. Um, so, you know, I think what, what amazes me about, what, what, one of the fun parts about this book is it allowed me to really nerd out and go deep on the, the Founding Fathers. And they were imperfect and they didn't get everything right, but their ability to um, sort of forecast some of the issues that we would be grappling with several hundred years later and their ability to be precise about certain things and leave others to ambiguity, their wisdom to make it extremely difficult to amend the Constitution um, has to leave you with tremendous admiration for what they created. Except for one f failure, which is not figuring out the vice presidency, how it was supposed to be selected, whether it should be a person of the same party, since they didn't know parties were gonna be this way, and then the succession. Why did they yeah. blow that one? Yeah, you know, I think it wasn't, the, I think because they didn't want a vice president, um, they didn't think of this in the context of the vice presidency. The, the Constitution was very clear that, it, what's funny is they, they, they were not clear about whether the vice president becomes president, but they were very clear if there was a vacancy with the president and vice president, the, 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 uh, the president pro tem becomes an acting President, and then different you know, presidential succession acts change that over history. There's a great anecdote, by the way, around presidential succe succession and amendment. So people don't realize this, but you know, when FDR was president-elect in 1933, he's nearly assassinated. So he arrives in Miami on board Vincent Astor's yacht, the Norma Hall, after a 14-day fishing cruise with his Harvard buddies. Um, and the first thing he does when he gets off the ship is he goes to give a speech in Bayside Park um, in, in Miami. So he's sitting on the back of his Buick in the three-car motorcade, and an Italian immigrant named Giuseppe Zangara fires five shots in 15 seconds at him. Um, and the bullets would have killed FDR as president-elect had a 100-pound woman named Lillian Cross not been standing next to the assassin, mm. seen him pull his 32 caliber, move her purse from her left arm to her right arm, and smack his arm with it, mm. um, thwarting his aim. It killed four people, including the mayor of Chicago who was visiting, but it saved president-elect uh, elect Roosevelt's life and you know, saved us the, the, the New Deal. But the interesting constitutional twist of this is nine days before that, you had the ratification of the 20th Amendment, which said if the president-elect is, uh, dies before taking the oath of office, the vice president-elect becomes president on inauguration day. Hmm. Um, after Teddy or, and Harry, who was the best or your favorite accidental president? The best or my favorite? Um, I think I got the most fascinated by, uh, probably by Chester Arthur. Um, 
Did somebody get a yay? Yes. You have to explain that to the me. The Chester after. Allen Arthur I, fan I think, club. I, sorry, but, but, but I, I, less because of his performance, although Arthur ends up, so he's, he's really one of the most loathsome, he's probably the most loathsome vice president in history um, because he's, he's, he's an he's a awful machine politician who spends his entire time as vice president subverting his own administration. So this is an amazing story where on the eve of James Garfield's inauguration, Roscoe Conkling, who's the big Republican New York boss, and Chester Arthur, who's basically, you know, who's the vice president-elect, but also kind of the, the COO of New York machine politics, they barge into Garfield's room at one in the morning, the night before he gives the inauguration, you know, essentially, you know, tearing him a new one about patronage. And they keep him up until almost four in the morning. He's exhausted when he delivers um, his inaugural address the next day. And then as vice president, he's just sabotaging his own administration. But the story of Chester Arthur is an amazing story of New York. And New York politics is very interesting. And how many of you by show of hands live on the Upper East Side? All right, good, there's a great story for you here because beginning when Chester Arthur is vice president, um, a mentally ill woman named Julia Sand who lived at 76 in Park begins writing him these letters telling him what a despicable man he is. As, you know, you're loathsome, you're awful. She compares him to the worst characters in the court of King Henry VIII, but every letter ends with there's still hope for you. Um, you can still be resurrected as a half decent man. Um, and I say that Julia Sand was the first average American to troll the president and get a respond, right. response, albeit by snail mail. And when he becomes president, he gets in his presidential carriage and he shows up at her house um, and they spend an hour together and it has a profound impact on his presidency. And Chester Arthur, um, when Garfield dies, um, has a total change of heart. He, he desperately wants to see James Garfield because the rumor is that, that Arthur is responsible for Garfield's assassination because the assassin says, you know, he basically did it for Chester Arthur um, to become president. And Arthur had actually met with him. Um, and he hoped that by killing the president, Arthur would become president and make him the consul general in Paris. And so Arthur, in James Garfield's 80 days on his deathbed, never gets in to see the president. And he finally, after they won't let him in to see the president, says, I need to see him to clear my good name so the president knows that I was not responsible for his mm -hmm. assassination. The president eventually dies, and, James, and, and Chester Arthur is sworn in at 123 Lexington Avenue, which today is an Indian bodega. Mm -hmm. During my research, I showed up there, and I said, I need to speak to the manager. Um, and I didn't realize the guy I was talking to was the manager, but he seemed to think I was a very irate person. And I finally explained to him why I needed to see the manager. I said, do you have any idea how historically significant this bodega is? And he said, eh, something about a president. And I pulled out the galley, um, uh, sort of an early galley that I got, and I said, let's take a picture together. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever go down to an Indian bodega at 123 Lexington Avenue, it was the townhouse of Chester Arthur where he was sworn in as the 21st president of the United States. Which leads us to our final question from the audience, and I'll sort of pin it on both Arthur and then Theodore Roosevelt and then uh, Truman. Can leadership be learned or is it born? And more specifically with those three people, what causes somebody to rise to a challenge and be a leader when it wasn't expected? So I think you can be a great leader and tactically botch that innate um, capability that you have. And there, there's plenty of examples of that through history. I also think you can be a pretty mediocre leader um, and rise to the occasion, as was the case of, of, of Harry Truman. And then there's a question of if you are sort of innately mediocre as a leader and circumstances elevate you, are you then a great leader? The other sort of observation that I'll make, which is interesting, I would spend my, you know, as I was writing, I spent five and a half years on this book and a lifetime fascinated by it. But in those five and a half years that I was writing this book, I was working as a, as a tech CEO. And, you know, naturally when you're sort of digging into history, you find connections back to, to everything. But I found that, you know, for this long period of time, during the day, I was focused on innovation in the future, and at night and on airplanes, I was digging into the, the past. But at the same time, we're in this sort of moment right now where everybody is obsessed with how do I become a better leader and you know, Harvard Business Reviews and you know, you know, case studies and executive coaches and this and that. And it sort of dawned on me as I was writing this book that nobody's learning about great historical figures in the context of business. And when I look at the accidental presidents, they're confronting all the same problems that, that business leaders are, balancing strategy and vision. What do you do when the context changes and you need a different group of people around you? Um, how do you handle unexpected crises? You know, they're dealing with organizational issues. They have cultural problems within their organization. Um, the difference between them and business leaders is they matter a lot more and the stakes are a lot higher. 
And so I think that for business leaders to look back at the Andrew Johnsons on the bad side and the Harry Trumans on the good side and draw lessons, I think would be a really powerful thing. And I think those of us who love history realize that the best leadership lesson books or biographies and histories, not seven secrets to successful Especially leadership. your biographies, Walter. None of whom were president, <laughs> although Ben Franklin should have been. Um, I'm gonna end with a parlor game question that you actually asked me by email, you may remember, three or four weeks ago, which is, and not just accidental presence, when we rank presidents, and there are always these, you know, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. type groups that get together and Lincoln and FDR are up there, and we rank the greatness of presidents. If you were to do your own ranking of presidents, first of all, who would be at the top and then who would be unexpectedly higher, like in my mind, Eisenhower? Yeah. So well, what I had pitched to Walter is this idea that for all of the rankings of presidents that have been done throughout history, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an unfair ranking because if you don't preside over a major moment where the consequences of your decision, good or bad, will have 100 plus year consequences, it's hard to be in that upper tier or that lower tier. Uh, category and so what I what I want to understand is absent these elevating contexts or these sort of diminishing contexts um, how do we evaluate these figures that, that, that led that led our land and I thought an interesting thing to do since we're all obsessed with innovation is to rank them by how innovative they were mm -hmm. and I think if you did that you know you'd get some unexpected you'd really dig into who the most creative presidents were who the biggest risk takers were um, you know, sort of who did, who had some of these silent achievements. I think you'd put Theodore Roosevelt really, really, really high, high on there. that one. Um, the, uh, and in terms of, um, so yeah, I think, I think measuring innovation would be a really interesting way to look at the presidency and it, it would be a nice way to tie history um, and historic figures with something that we all spend a lot of time talking about today. You're a great innovator and a great You're historian. Welcome. Thank you, mate. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, he will be signing books. We got to get him, keep him on those bestseller lists.